we're all here. So I'll just start. Um, my name is Elaine Byrne and I'm a guest researcher here at the University of Oslo. And I like always saying here, um, it doesn't physically mean in Oslo, it's, um, it's my connection with them. Um, so very warm welcome to all of you who are listening to this live and also welcome to those who are looking at this in playback. Um, I know there's a lot of interesting sessions going on. Um, so thank you for joining this. As you will see from the title, we are looking at non-communicable diseases and looking at how DHS IS2 is helping in the management um, of the, those diseases. Um, we'll look at three very interesting presentations today, um, starting off with Caroline Bain, the Senior Programme Officer from Women's Cancer in PATH, who will look at the uptake on tracking breast cancer and in Peru and the data that they've collected. That will be followed by a presentation by Blaise Mofende from our DHIS, our HISP group in Rwanda, uh, with his focus on data use, implementation and documentation. And he'll look at how we can improve the monitoring and care of cancer patients, looking at enabling the information exchange between DHIS2 and their cancer registry system. And then the last presentation will take us away from cancer to rehabilitation by Wouter de Groot from the WHO Rehabilitation Programme. And interesting, we'll just look at the early lessons from the development of the WHO Rehabilitation Digital Package. And that will be across a number of countries, including Nepal, Rwanda, Pakistan, Palestine and Jordan. Um, as with the other sessions, we'll keep the questions at the Q&A until the end, but please keep posting them in the chat and on the community of practice, and we'll get to as many of them at the end um, that we can answer. Um, but for those who are listening also in playback, you can post your questions on the community of practice and um, follow up with the presenters there. So really, a, a, um, a thank you to the presenters for agreeing to present here. Um, just to let you know, there'll be 12 minutes. I'll just interject at 10 minutes to let you know that you've two more minutes. And um, that's just really to facilitate some timekeeping and so that we have some time for questions at the end. So I don't want to take any more of your time. So Caroline, I'd like you, if you could share your screen, if you could start the presentation on data collected uptake um, on tracking breast cancer patients in Peru with DHIS2. Very welcome. I'll turn off my screen just for now, Caroline, just in terms of the bandwidth. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to anyone's on the West Coast as I am in Seattle. <laughs> 6 a.m. here. Yes, I was just going to say thank you very much, Carolyn. <laughs> it's all good. It's light outside at least, so that's, that's very good. All right. And get this slideshow going. So again, um, thanks, Elaine, for the introduction. We I did present at the last conference last September when we were just getting started and developing and building the system, but we hadn't started actually collecting data. So we're very pleased to come back and share the that we are indeed in collecting data in Peru. And my I will just mention that yesterday my colleagues um, from Peru presented this in Spanish. So this is kind of a review for anyone who doesn't speak Spanish and also of course for the NCD group. Um, Trujillo is in the northern part of Peru. This is where the work is going on. It's about an hour flight north of Lima, and it's the third most populous region, La Libertad region in, in northern Peru. We identified the need for this digital tracking really from the, national, the cancer coordinator there in Trujillo was desperate to have some kind of digital tracking to make sure they didn't lose women to follow up and could get them the treatment um, as quickly as possible. So this system was built so that we could see women from clinical breast exam at the primary level to ultrasound and triage biopsy at secondary level, and then diagnosis and treatment at the tertiary level. And I'll also just mention that um, this work is done uh, using a different model than you might usually use for breast cancer detection in areas where they don't have regular access to mammograms. 
So again, the need that she was seeing um, at the local level was this weak paper-based referral system uh, where diagnosis was not evident for um, an abnormal clinical breast exam. And the primary and secondary health level providers did not know the results or the treatment um, for the patients they preferred. And they had that lack of a digital electric, uh, electronic system to calculate the time elapsed between first screening and then diagnosis and treatment. And that, as many people may know, the WHO recommends be within a 90 day um, window. So if you can't calculate how many days it was from your first screening to diagnosis and treatment, that um, makes it difficult to say if you were meeting that goal. And again, the solution is the DHIS2 um, pilot network for Trujillo. And we worked with our partners, PATH um, as a coordinator and ICAS in Spain as the consultant helping build the system. The implementation process was selecting the participating hospital and clinics to begin with, and that needed to have the uh, clinical uh, health providers that would do with the clinical breast exam and final biopsy triage and have the computer skills. Wanted to make sure they had access to internet, although we did use tablets that could um, be uploaded later to internet um, system. We chose 14 facilities and then had regular meetings with the regional um, cancer coordinators and PATH and ECHAS to define the indicators and select the variables. And it was just a really amazing experience of, of health system strength. And I would say at that really excellent communication and collaboration and, and just couldn't be better. And then we also improved internet access by adding routers, cables, access points, and connectors, and uh, tablets and laptops for those 14 health establishments. And then the hosting is done by Linode. So these are just a list of the clinics and hospitals that received um, in their different areas. I should say that 58, there are 58 total um, clinics and hospitals in this health network of Trujillo. So we were just in 14 of them. The training process was originally supposed to be in person. And then when COVID hit, we had to pivot to an online option. And this was done virtually with Zoom and Moodle, a five day uh, training with four days synchronous and one day asynchronous. You can see there were a total of 25 professionals trained. The first group was the super users from the local Ministry of Health to Heal Health Network and PATH. And then um, the other um, end users from the 14 health establishments, the midwives, perhaps professional midwives, doctors, and then those at the pathology of the Eden Norte um, Cancer Institute. And the validation process was we validated the variables in the DHIS2 pilot project. And the health workers started real-time data entry for their patients at the different levels in October, 2020. And then we had constant um, support from the team and from the super users and a WhatsApp group was started so they could share messages and answer questions to the whole team. And now we've done the transfer over um, for the, <clears throat> excuse me, to Heal Health Network to, um, uh, be the managers and have the, the Dominion. And some of the results are we did successfully implement the DHS2 to track the patients through the breast cancer um, pathway in these 14 health establishments and the Regional Cancer Institute, and they do, did receive those laptops. Um, 25 trained and the really important result I feel is that they are doing the real-time follow-up of patients um, with abnormal breast cancer findings and that we now have 1,091 entries. Our goal with the pilot was to get to 800 so we're exciting we're past that by far and the other really important part of this is Peruvian coordinating institutes the, the cancer coordinators and the local Ministry of Health is committed to sustaining this digital platform. Um, these are just some of the, the 
um, screens we can see in the reports. And just a little bit of the data there, among the 41 abnormal clinical breast exams um, performed, then there were 35 ultrasound triage performed on those at the secondary level. And then 17 fine needle biopsy aspirations were performed and six cancers, breast cancers have been detected. And uh, just to reiterate that for, for the cancer coordinators there and the health providers at all levels, it's really very exciting to be able to see and follow and track their patients through um, all the different levels and see if they're at the next step and if they've had treatment and, and so on to be able to, to see all their data quickly. So a few obstacles we found, a high rate of staff turnover makes it difficult in, in the IT department, but also anyone who's trained and then leaves, we know is a, is a difficult situation. There was limited, limited familiarity with tablets. So that was something that people had to learn the higher learning curve for tablets. Laptops were not, or not, did not have that issue. The DHS2 capture application did not allow for a date change initially. So there were some problems with that, but they were resolved. And the first month we had some trouble getting the um, few of the users to input the data. And some of the strengths were local support for setting up the laptops was great and strong support from the Ministry of Health coordinators has been um, amazing. We have commitment from these professionals to incorporate the digital data entry into their daily activities. And I think this is a very important aspect to, to mention because we're asking them to do something that they wouldn't have normally had to do. When they filled out the paper forms previously, those would be given to someone to enter, data enter, um, and they wouldn't have had to do anything. So now this is adding a step into what they do as they're doing the clinical breast exams and they're doing these different steps, they are then data entering immediately. So it's a new, new step and we've had good uptake with that, which is very exciting. And excellent communication resolving the questions and solving problems. And again, wonderful synergy with this whole team that put it together. So we recommend monitoring, um, conducting quality control activities, always close coordinate, coordination with the IT area, Ministry of Health and a strong signal. The internet always makes it easier for everything. I did wanna mention that um, the cancer coordinators at this local level in Trujillo and La Libertad Peru are, are very pleased with the system and actually would love to expand it to cervical cancer. So it's just now, only breast cancer, but they would like to expand it if that was possible and expand to the full 58 um, clinic and hospitals. So um, that's it for me today. And thank you, gracias for listening. Thank you very much, Caroline, for your early morning uh, presentation. Um, and I'd just like to encourage other people to put questions in the chat um, and Caroline would be able to answer those as the other presentations are going on. But I think it shows a really um, it kind of exemplifies what we mean designing for data use, Caroline, by looking at all the infrastructural issues, addressing kind of internet connectivity, right up to being flexible around kind of moving training online and um, illustrates really the commitment of everybody involved. Um, so what I'd like to do now do is hand over to you, Blaise, in terms of your presentation on improving the monitoring care of cancer patients by enabling information exchange between DHIS2 and the cancer registry system. So if you can share your screen, Blaise. Thank you. So share my screen once again. And again, if, if, you, if you're bandwidth and you're comfortable with it, it's nice to see your face while you're presenting. Um, but yeah. I understand if your if your bandwidth isn't great, it, it may not be it, it may not be conducive to the presentation. So I over to you, Blaze. Yeah, I think you'll be okay. In case it's not, you can always tell me to take it off. And then yes, it's great. It's so very welcome, Blaze. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Blaze Defender. Uh, currently working in his Flander, and today we shall be going through the improving and monitoring. Care cancer patients by enabling information exchange between 
the current DHS2 registry and the CAN reg that they've been using in the past years. So I'll start with an introduction of uh, the current data render. Uh, it was not being collected in the proper way for the past years until 2018 when they reinitiated uh, the use of CAN reg registry. But uh, up to then, uh, the Global Observatory for Cancer had estimated that they had recorded 10,704 cases, and of those, 7,662 had died due to cancer. And as a result, there was uh, an initiation of investing more in, in terms of finances, in terms of uh, equipping the data management store of cancer in Rwanda. And uh, part of the things they started implementing was a five year national cancer control plan in Rwanda that started with chemotherapy uh, services being provided at one of our centers in Wutaro. And then they were also invested in two linear accelerator radiotherapy machines at the New Rwanda Cancer Center, which was actually initiated by the president himself, His Excellency Paul Kagame. Uh, also, there's also been a light of increased research, research studies by different institutes and individuals in Rwanda, which has called upon uh, a better management system that can give uh, rel reliable data that can be used in such studies. So I'm going to pass you through the existing system, the way the, the workflow is working, uh, which in, uh, started from health hospital site, where they collected data and entered it in the, into the CANREC. CANREC works uh, offline on a desktop version. It can't, they, they don't currently have an online version. So it, they would enter data from the hospital site and then use either papers in case the, the site does not have computers or they become overwhelmed and then they would have to enter the data into the CANREC. After entering the data in CANREC, the data would be exported, of which the data exported can only be in the format of text file, and they had to ex uh, export patient data, tumor, and then the source of the cancer. After importing, exporting the data at the hospital level, they had to send the data either via email or they put the information on a USB drive, which is then sent to the hierarchy of RBC. Then the data managers at RBC, which is the Rwanda Biomedical Center, would compile the files from different hospitals across Rwanda and then uh, import them into the final data hub of Canary that is found at uh, the headquarters of RBC. However, uh, upon all that uh, whole process from the hospitals up to the national level in RBC, they, they had also last year in January, they had created a DHS2 tracker system that they would also enter the same data into the system for just storage uh, as a, a backup in case something was to happen to the offline system of Canric. I will show you, this is a, a data entry form of the application Canric that works offline. If you see here, you'll find that there is a patient record where they put in the information. And then here there's the tumor records and then the source records. All these are downloaded from different files. You have to first download the patient record, then download the tumor record, and then the source record. So three excels will be submitted from hospitals and health centers across Rwanda. Uh, if you see here, you find that this is the export format and then the import format where uh, you would use to export the data by hospitals and then taken to RBC headquarters and then imported files, import the file, which is final, into the um, data storage at RBC. So uh, upon all that, the, the council program saw that there was a need to revise what was being done. And one of the things that were defined was that the data was compromised in the sense that if information was being uh, exchanged via email, one wrong in one room later in an email, the data would end up in the wrong location, which is not good for the patient. There was also a possibility of data loss. Uh, if someone is moving with a flash disk, it could have been easily lost, got lost, and then the information would get lost, which would have been seen as a problem. There's also uh, a threat of duplication. While they were compiling the Excel files, uh, there was also time consuming. When the data was required at a health facility, at the national level, it would require them to communicate to different hospitals and different sites, which would also take more time than anticipated. So 
fast decision making has become a challenge. Uh, the fact that the system itself does not currently have an, an online future did not uh, provide real time data that is better for decision making when it comes to data. There, there also at the hospital level, due to the lack of uh, uh, enough equipment, maybe computers or tablets, and for, they were not able to continuously use the system as they preferred. So sometimes they would write the information on papers and then transfer the data into the clinic later on, which can cause uh, a margin of error in terms of the data that is needed. So uh, I'm gonna describe to you uh, the application that was being designed by us that, that is going to facilitate and bridge that gap. Uh, this healthcare provider enters the data into the tracker system that was redesigned uh, to, to be able to, to, to create data that is acceptable in Canary 5. Upon entering the data, it is stored into the system, which is then converted so that it, converted by the application. So the application's job is to convert the data to be able to be accepted into the Canric system until they can finally transfer the whole program to be used only in DHS2. But as of now, it is going to be working hand in hand. So the application, what it shall be doing is uh, get the data that has been entered using the tracker system, then convert it into the code that is accepted by Canric 5. The current system that existing in Rwanda of Canary, the data that's inside is coded. Uh, let's say if it is a district in Shigali, it, if it's a Shichiro, it is going to be named as 01 instead of Shichiro. So that was uh, that is the goal of the application. Once the data is converted and imported by the national level, it is then entered into uh, Canary 5 for storing and analysis. Uh, the reason the analysis is not currently being done into the DHS system is because they have not yet uh, set up the indicators that are currently accepted by the International Cancer Association Registry, which is uh, then that shall be the next step forward. Uh, uh, this here you see is the application view. Uh, currently, the features that are working in the first version are patient tumor source. The patient part will allow you to, to filter whether by date or by location, and then you can be able to download the formats. The only formats being right now is the text file, since it's the one accepted in Canary 5. And then you can be able to do the same criteria in tumor and source. In the future, there is a hope that the, the future of data filter will be allowing you to just uh, filter one time and then be able to transfer all the three files in one round, which is expected to be done as well in the period of August. Uh, and then among the challenges that we may have faced are uh, the metadata mapping. When it came to mapping, as I explained earlier, the, the system in Canary uses coded, coded metadata. So that required uh, for us to also ensure that the, the, the metadata in the DHIS to tracker system will be converted into the codes that are acceptable in Canary Fives. Another thing, uh, it required the team to, re to redesign the tracker system that was being used before to ensure that uh, all the data elements and the variables are the same as Canary Five, so that whenever it's about to convert, it does not receive a sort of an error. Now, the current status is that the cancer application has been designed and developed right now the into implementation phase. And uh, it's being, uh, it's, they, the training should uh, start as soon as the program has formed the team. Uh, they also the dashboard and report configurations is gonna be the next phase where we can be able to, to create indicators and uh, design reports that are acceptable by the International Cancer Registry Association which is what we hope to achieve after this period in this manner where any other places using DHS2 and also having Canary 5 or the oncology program can be able to apply the same system once it is implemented successfully in London. Uh, that is it from my side and I will end with this 
wonderful quote from Peter Sandergaard, information is the oil of the 21st century and analytics is the combustion engine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Blaise. And I think it really illustrates that my heart went out to the healthcare professionals when you were describing the initial um, system around registering the data for the, in the cancer registry. Um, and, and you il illustrated clearly the need to improve that process. I think it also illustrates a, a very different example of where you have legacy systems in place and how you actually deal with those legacy systems. Um, so again, keep posting there in the chat and I'm going to hand you over to Wutzer, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, who's going to take about the early lessons around what WHO rehabilitation digital package development is about. So over to you, Wutzer. Thank you, Elaine, and uh, good day to everybody. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, I will present about the development of a rehabilitation digital package and early lessons learned from pilot testing in further fine tuning the standards that we will be proposing from uh, WHO. So I am working for the uh, rehabilitation program at headquarters. Um, and I guess you can see my screen. Um, so just to start off with, uh, in early 2017, WHO has launched this initiative called the Rehabilitation 2030 Initiative, which aimed at um, raising political awareness about the uh, largely unmet needs for rehabilitation globally and to unify the rehabilitation community to address these unmet needs. And um, 10 areas of action or priority areas of action have been identified and agreed upon during these global meetings, uh, of which one has been to integrate rehabilitation to health information systems, and especially to collect data that are relevant for rehabilitation, such as sector, sector performance. So this is why we have started to develop an aggregate module for rehabilitation. Um, and defining uh, 14 indicators that, that inform our standard set. So we have been dividing these indicators into three subsets. One subset that applies to all levels of healthcare that do provide rehabilitation. Then there's one additional indicator for the primary healthcare level. And then there's a few more that apply to uh, dedicated rehabilitation uh, wards. In terms of analyzing the, the data, we have been providing uh, a framework which is based on the results chain. Um, because, of course, from the rehabilitation perspective, we're looking at health system strengthening. And so we have been grouping the indicators that have been selected for the standard set uh, into the different domains of a results chain. So we have the rehabilitation bed density and personnel density, which sits within the input domain. We have five indicators uh, that capture data on um, uh, accessibility. So these are rehabilitation service utilization uh, data and uptake data. And then we have two indicators on the quality of rehabilitation services, which is the availability of the individualized care plan and the length of stay in hospitals. And then we have two indicators that uh, capture data on the coverage for uh, people with acute and complex rehabilitation needs. And then we have one indicator that captures the functioning change after a rehabilitation episode, which is the overall aim of rehabilitation. And then lastly, we have two indicators um, that talk about the health system efficiency, which is the um, uh, rehabilitation waiting time and rehabilitation referral across the different levels of healthcare. This has been uh, configured with Oslo University as in developing this prototype with DHIS2 and comes with uh, dashboards for the different sections that we needed to provide analysis for. 
And of course, uh, a few data entry forms have been developed. We have uh, data entry forms for the outpatient uh, rehabilitation department. There's one for the inpatient rehabilitation department, and there's one for the dedicated rehabilitation ward. So um, proceeding to the pilot testing. So now this prototype has been finalized and we have embarked in pilot testing early this year. And this table is providing an overview of the countries uh, we are engaging with. And in the column to the left, you can see the first steps that are recommended in the scope of pilot testing. And as you can see, all these countries uh, have been involved, but don't really uh, follow the same order in terms of steps. We have been in contact with Nepal and the Rwanda Ministries of Health, uh, which has been a very learnful experience in terms of exchanging um, monthly reporting templates from rehab facilities, uh, which have been paper-based, uh, their DHIS2 reporting in, in Rwanda as well. Um, and defining the country indicator set or updating the uh, country indicator set based on the standards that WHO is proposing. But unfortunately, we have not been involved from the beginning in terms of multi-stakeholder engagement or uh, reporting readiness assessments, uh, nor have we been involved in the adaptation of the national DHIS2 system uh, or data collection, which um, leaves us without uh, lessons learned in terms of uh, data collection and managing uh, and the use and the analysis of the data. In Pakistan, we had um, some consultative meetings with Ministry of Health and had uh, a strong multi-stakeholder engagement in the country, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, priorities have shifted and this country has not proceeded uh, since. In Palestine, um, some interesting findings have been that rehabilitation is not provided in public sector. So Ministry of Health has decided to expand the use of the HIS2 to private sector. Um, so they have been, uh, been uh, committed. They have proceeded with uh, the reporting um, readiness assessment, and they have been uh, defining their country indicator set based on the standards we have been proposing, but um, um, what came out is that they have been asking for a case-based uh, reporting, whereas our uh, module is an aggregate module. And then in Jordan, uh, public sector, sector is involved. Um, they have, all, have already um, um, the, made progress in terms of the different steps. Uh, again, Jordan has asked for a case-based um, uh, reporting system. And as well, Jordan has its own electronic platform called Gyres, which um, leads to a few uh, challenges. So summarizing the challenges we have from pilot testing in these countries, first of all, we have uh, had this conflict of priorities um, and interests from the different stakeholders involved such as in the example of Nepal and Rwanda. And uh, in order to meet each other's priorities, some further dialogue would have been desirable and, and needed. We have had a request for case-based reporting. Uh, as mentioned before, this has been unexpected, um, which now gives us the um, challenge to develop additional case-based reporting um, collection for these countries. And then we have the Jordan uh, situation, which has a different data collection software, or at least is a non dhis 2 uh, system. And uh, discussions are now uh, going on in terms of um, adapting the national electronic um, software to the uh, selected country indicator set. Um, or to uh, investigate interoperability and how the HIS2 can support this process. In terms of early lessons learned, uh, it seems very important that early engagement with countries and communication is crucial to meet each other's uh, needs and to be better prepared. 
um, we have learned that to consider private sector from the start is crucial um, from the Pal Palestine example um, as issues may arise in terms of data governance and coordination. And then we want to stress the fact that the pilot testing of a proposed standard set from WHO is crucial as we do value uh, um, issues that arise from implementation and the implication these have in fine-tuning our standards and in providing analyzes guidance. Uh, so pilot testing is really shaping the final product. And lastly, to end, we had a, an interesting observation from all countries um, who all have been selecting our subset that applies to all levels of healthcare, which, and it might be too early, but uh, probably we will end up from the WHO perspective with a, a core set of indicators that applies to all levels of healthcare and an expanded set that applies to primary healthcare and the dedicated rehabilitation uh, ward. So I stop here and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hute. Um, and it's great that you all, not alone, you stuck to time, but most of you have gone under time. So I think this is the session which has actually got a considerable time for questions. Now, before asking, um, interjecting with questions I have myself, I have seen that, Caroline, you've been very busy on the chat answering the questions there. Um, do you want to add anything um, to the questions? I know you had one around the management of the kind of tablets and how, how that was put in place the kind of super users being trained between July and data collection in September. Um, and then looking at the shift from paper to electronic. Do you want to add anything, Caroline, that you didn't manage to get into your responses? Because we have some time here for you to do so. Um, sure, I'm not sure if I clearly ex um, answered all their questions. So. I, yes, I did say they, there's a big desire to, to go completely digital from the, the local Ministry of Health there in Trujillo, and but this would take considerable more time to set that up and get all of the fields so that it's not the complete um, clinical background of the women. So if they want to go paperless, they'll have to add more fields to the DHIS2 mm. system. So mm -hmm. that'll take some more time. Um, yeah, then the super users have been great at helping keep everyone on track. I think there's a question about how the, the computers are working. And I will say that's been a little bit of an issue that seems everything's siloed so that if you're in, if you're in maternal and child, you're not gonna share your computer with the people who are in the cancer. And so, um, we were hoping there would be more sharing um, and that we wouldn't have to purchase a computer or laptop because if there was one already at the facility, they should be able to manage. But I think it's also a bit of, of time constraint. If you want to do real time data entry, you need that with you. And so I can see both sides. It's, it's a tricky situation. You said it's on quite a small scale. So in terms of kind of the management of that, it's, it's, it's been small enough and it would be interesting looking at um, the scaling. And I think it's a similar yeah. problem. I think most, most countries would like to move away from the paper-based based system, but it is a, a kind of a bigger leap to um, getting a completely electronic system. Um, there is a question there for you, Blaze, around um, availability of the um, app and um, wondering whether or not and at what stage that might be available on the App Store or the availability of the API to link CanReg um, 5 and DHIS. Do you have anything to say on that, Blaze? Yes, thank you. Uh, so yeah, th th that is the hope. Once it is complete and has been developed and implemented, once we have fixed the uh, few errors uh, after receiving the feedbacks from the field, we okay. intend to share it with everyone else with the DHS community. Okay, that's great, great. Um, and are there any other questions? I mean, you can raise your hands as well if you would like. I guess um, uh, Vutra, I, I guess I'd have a question really because you you've shown 
um, looking at the, the the process from you know initially getting consensus over what the indicators would be and helping to standardize those, the process by which you and the differences you found across countries. So I think you gave the example of Nepal not being able to get in there at the initial stages. So then then how do you configure with the same indicators? Um, and I think you tried to generalize it in terms of, you know, the best practice would be. But how do you think, you know, it is possible to get in at those early stages, such as you have done within Jordan? Yeah, and that's a good question, Elaine. Um, of course, while developing our digital package, uh, other countries had already started the process. So we were not ready for uh, Nepal, for instance, who had already okay. uh, been a bit further. So that has been unfortunate, but um, so in, in terms of, and still this experience has been learnful, looking at what, what, what indicators that have been selected and what has been usually collected in, for rehabilitation in these countries and to map against our standards. So this, at least it has been a, a yep. piece of the uh, pilot testing exercise we have been found uh, to, to be really useful. And will you change the indicators like when you said you're gonna have a core set facility, will countries be able to configure it to change those indicators? Because the problem with that, then you have a lack of standardization um, in reporting as well. Well, the thing is, probably it's early to say so, but um, countries that are still in the process, such as Jordan and Palestine, will tell us uh, whether the indicators we are proposing are actually uh, relevant, mm -hmm. useful, and from the feedback that comes from data collection and using the use of the data, but we are not there yet. Um, we, do, we did have um, some interesting feedback for one indicator that is on the rehabilitation uh, waiting time because disaggregation types that, that we were uh, proposing didn't really uh, fit re well in terms of um, data collection. That wasn't uh, considered easy, uh, collecting the data and the disaggregation types. So we have split that indicator into two. So this has been a very learnful uh, experience in terms of fine tuning our indicator set that we propose. But, okay. yeah. but other yeah. than that, other than that, countries have not um, asked for other types or uh, other data elements to be collected. So it is reassuring from the WHO mm. perspective that we are not proposing anything weird to countries. Mm. It is what is collected at this point. Um, what we do realize is that our standard set uh, goes beyond what is re being reported at this point. And this is what I was trying to say with a, course, a core uh, set of indicators and an expanded set of indicators. It's a nice process, an iterative process of kind of agreeing on those indicators and then seeing within the pilots whether or not that kind of confirms it. Um, um, the, the other question before I go on to the question raised by Arlene in the chat is, in, do you think you will look at doing a, a case-based um, uh, package or, or do you think it would be better to kind of stick with implementing an aggregate form first? And if that kind of works, you know, it's saying, well, you know, now maybe try the, the tracker version. Yes, and this has been a, a very important spin-off of the pilot testing so far. So mm -hmm. both Palestine and Jordan have requested for case-based reporting. So this uh, was interesting for us to realize that this might be a request for other countries in the future when finally launching the, 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 the product. Um, so yes, we will uh, develop case -based, um, a case-based module as well but have decided to first conclude on the aggregate and then develop the case based based on the aggregate. Mm, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much um, there. And I'm just going to go back into the chat in terms of, um, for Caroline, just in terms of the cost, the investment cost estimate to link up the three levels, and then I'll get to your question, Aaron. So um, Caroline? It just is how much additional investment to increase the scope to include breast cancer screening or well are you able to answer that <laughs> i i think both of those are a little bit tricky um yeah. so much of the cost is 
people's time, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's really personnel time. So we had a really great consultancy with um, the Spanish EJAS uh, Foundation, and they did all of the software development. So it was really coordination on the part of PATH and then with the Trujillo group. So it, there wasn't any extra cost to link the three systems that was from the beginning um, developed into the system. And I could uh, message directly with Arlene if we want to get into, you know, what it cost us to do. Yeah. But um, breast, and it was always breast cancer. So it's it's linked into their system, but it's not um, something that's within their whole, it is a bit siloed in that we are just looking at breast cancer. So it's not part of a larger um, public health registry of health system. Okay. Um, and then Erin, um, um, don't know, Rebecca, did you want to say anything particular around the comment you've put there about working um, with Rwanda? Oh, it's okay. So, so let me go to your question, Erin, in terms of, okay, sorry, Rebecca can't unmute, but it's fine, Rebecca. I think what Rebecca has pointed out there that we are looking at um, working with the work with Rwanda to look at their configuration and look at a metadata package. Um, and I'll let you come in at the end there, um, Rebecca, if you have anything else to add on that. But to Erin's question there is, what are the non-negotiables that are needed? Uh, to work a successful implementation. Um, I work for an international surgical organization that does that have a centralized data collection system, nor do we have a tech skill to develop or deploy something like this. Okay, that's a, that's a really, really interesting question. So, so you know, what, what do we have to have in position before beginning? I'm not sure which of the presenters would like to answer that someone's starting off looking maybe for kind of surgical um, data, how, how do they start off in, in, from the beginning? I don't know, Vutra, Caroline, you want to? I can try and answer. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's such thing as non-negotiables because many of the aspects needed for implementation uh, can be built and, and capacity building is possible, uh, whether it's in terms of um, data collection management, uh, guidance in terms of the analysis, um, the platform. What I, what I do think is the main obstacle looking from the surgical perspective is that you would need at least some uh, agreed data elements to collect and if there's no standards for surgery or the type of surgery even, I guess that would be uh, an issue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and Caroline, did you add anything to that? Um, no, I, I, I think there are a lot of logistical things that need to happen. So I think making sure no, for us, it was actually the down to the equipment. Do they have the computers? Do they have the internet system? Depending on where you're working and, and how well equipped they are already, I think that's important. And then making sure that they have the ability to, to do the data entry, as I said, is sometimes a, a stumbling block as well, so, or a barrier. Um, but it it's, for us, it's been a really great solution, DHS2. So, I hope that, that it would be something they could use as well. That's great. And then Erin, just to add to that, I mean, I know there's a group in the G4 Alliance that are looking, as, as Vutra has pointed out, looking at developing that set of core indicators. Um, so, so that's kind of a very, you know, kind of global level look. But I think as a, Caroline's presentation has shown, you can also approach this from a very kind of local level pilot study. So I think it really depends, there's different angles to this and it, it would go down to, you know, what is actually needed at that particular level. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Anyone else want to come in on this? 
I think I've, I've addressed most of those questions there. Okay, so let, if I just kind of wrap up um, the session here, I think what's been really very interesting to explore and what the different presentations have have kind of illustrated are, you know, we're looking at a very kind of local level, looking at those kind of logistical issues and, and very broadly around, you know, what are the infrastructural issues, what are the capacity issues that all need to be in place to get a system up and running. And then we can look at it from the more kind of global level about the agreement on the, you know, the level of the indicators, the um, a, a standardizing those and then looking at the feedback you can get from multi countries. And I think Blaze's presentation adds to this in terms of looking at something that's new versus bringing in a legacy system and the implications then of how do you actually integrate and make these systems interoperable. So I think it was a really interesting session. Um, and um, question on where, uh, where can we get contact information of the presenters if they, on our community of practice, um, you'll find uh, Blaise and Caroline and um, Vutra, I don't know if you're, you're up on the community of practice, but um, you can contact them and uh, message them through our community of practice. All the presentations are also available um, on SCED as well. And I think most of you have put in your email addresses on those presentations.